Um, in my book, uh, Here's the Jacket, <clears throat> I try to bring, uh, bring John Brown back to where I think he belongs, not on the loony fringe of American history, but at the very heart of it. Uh, along with uh, such famous movers and shakers as Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln, Brown was the only abolitionist who repeatedly took up arms against slavery before the Civil War during the period of so-called Bleeding Kansas in the 1850s. Brown led a party of eight followers who raided some cabins on Pottawatomie Creek and slaughtered five pro-slavery settlers with swords. Three years later, Brown raided Harper's Ferry, Virginia with 21 men in an effort to liberate slaves in the area and then flee with them to the near nearby mountains with the idea of making periodic raids on plantations and free slaves who would become part of his ever-growing army of liberation. What happened is that Brown did take over Harper's Ferry, liberated many slaves in the area, but he stalled too long and he was captured uh, by federal troops under Robert E. Lee. He was imprisoned, brought to trial, found guilty on three counts and was hanged on December 2nd, 1859. Brown had dated his hatred against slavery from the time when he was age 12 when he saw a slave boy that he befriended being beaten with a shovel, an incident that made him, quote, swear eternal war against slavery, as he put it. From a young age then, hatred of slavery flamed in the core of his being. Yes, but why? After all, slave boys and girls and their parents were being beaten and driven outside every day, and few had John Brown's extreme reaction. What was it about Brown that provoked this re revulsion? I show in my book that it was the unusual brand of religion that his family espoused. He was born in 1800 during the early flush of the Republican period, not too long after the ratification of the Constitution, which had separated church and state in America. When this occurred, American Protestantism was sent spinning in all kinds of directions as different individuals gave their own interpretations of Christianity and in some cases started new churches. Um, I mean, today there are over 250 different Protestant sects and denominations in America, and that's where this whole kind of proliferation um, began, uh, or accelerated, rather, accelerated. Uh, some very original practices emerged during this period under the name of Protestant Christianity. In Oneida, New York, the Protestant perfectionists under John Humphrey Noyes practiced complex marriage, whereby all men and all women in the community were considered married to each other, both spiritually and physically. Complex indeed. Uh, elsewhere, the Mormon church instituted, instituted polygamy in the name of the Bible. One Mormon leader reportedly had 52 wives. Even more complex. Uh, then there were the Shakers who practiced celibacy. No comment. Uh, and the Millerites who gathered on hillsides waiting for the end of the world uh, as prophesied in the Bible. They said October 1844. Nope, didn't happen. October 1845. And then, <laughs> um, as odd as some of these offshoots of American Protestantism were, none was as bizarre for its day as the religion that took hold in the, the family of Owen and Ruth Brown, John Brown's parents. This family religion, which was never spelled out in the early going but always acted on, went something like this. I happen to be a Caucasian and a Calvinistic Protestant. You are perhaps black, or Native American, or Asian, another ethnicity, or Catholic, Jewish, atheist, some other religion. That doesn't matter in the relationship that I have with you. All that matters is mutual respect of each other's rights. Uh, nothing else counts. For the Browns, this unspoken creed had a special meaning for their feelings about the millions of enslaved blacks in America. Uh, John Brown would always, always say that his abolitionism was rooted in two things, the Golden Rule and the Declaration of Independence. But there was nothing intrinsically anti-slavery about either of these. Many Southerners who were ardent Christians used the Golden Rule to defend slavery. They said they were doing blacks a huge favor, do unto, do unto others. Uh, they were doing blacks a huge favor by bringing them to America and exposing them to the so-called blessings of Christian civilization. As for the Declaration of Independence, of course, its author, Jefferson, owned nearly 200 slaves. And another founding father, George Washington, owned over, over 200 slaves. And there were many, many Southerners who venerated the Declaration and yet still, still held slaves. The Brown's fam Brown family's interpretation of the Golden Rule and the Decla uh, Declaration were odd, quirky Protestant ones. Uh, 
All the families as I men, uh, mem members, as I mentioned, were strict Calvinists. John Brown's uh, favorite theologian was Jonathan Edwards. In the Brown family, the righteous, angry God of the Old Testament fused with anti-slavery passion to produce a new militancy. It's a kind of, uh, I almost see it as a kind of little cult of, you know, all of a sudden, this is, this is how we should apply Christianity. Um, at least with that particular intensity uh, that, that, that came out in, in, in the family. Um, not that John Brown was instinctively a warrior. To the contrary, as a young man, he refused to, list, to enlist in the army on moral, on moral grounds. It was only the later violence of pro-slavery mobs that converted him into being a soldier of the Lord. Brown was distinguished by his avoidance of the racism of his day. Ironically, many other anti-slavery people were tinged with uh, the prevalent racism that governed that culture, unfortunately. Lincoln thought that blacks and whites couldn't live on equal terms in America because of essential differences between the races. For a long time, Lincoln advocated colonization or shipping blacks uh, abroad uh, once they were emancipated to places like Liberia or Central America. Another anti-slavery uh, figure, the scientist Louis, Louis Agassiz, claimed that a, tip a typical black person had the brain of an undeveloped white fetus. Still another uh, anti-slavery leader, uh, Cassius Clay, thought that the only place for blacks was in the tropical sun eating bananas. And mind you, these were the opponents of slavery. Uh, for John Brown, in contrast, open, openness to people of different ethnicities was in his blood. As a boy growing up in the Ohio wilderness, he befriended Native American children in the woods. He learned the native language, even went uh, through a kind of play uh, ceremony initiating him into an Indian tribe. Later on, when he was a farmer in Pennsylvania, a white neighbor came to him complaining about the Indians in the region, asking Brown if he'd join him and take up guns and drive off the natives, drive them off the property. And John Brown replied, I will have nothing to do, to do with so mean an act. I would, I would sooner take my gun and help drive you out of the country. Brown, John Brown was one of the few first white Americans to apply fully the notions of equality and brotherhood to the issue of race. He lived among blacks, he worked with them, he sought their advice, he admitted them to his home and dinner table. Not only was he close to prominent blacks such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, but he chose uh, to live among obscure blacks in the, in the colony at North Elba in upstate New York near Lake Placid. One famous white visitor to his home, the popular novelist R Richard Henry Dana, two years before the mast and so forth, was shocked when Brown had several of the local blacks sit alongside the whites at the dinner table, treating them with the same respect uh, as he did the whites and integrating them into the conversation, always using Mr. and Mrs. Uh, when, he, when he addressed them. Uh, and as I say, Dana was uh, rather stunned by that. Also, uh, Brown's military plans stemmed largely uh, from blacks, particularly slave revolts in the American South and the rebellions of the mountain-based Maroons of the West Indies. Among his great heroes were Nat Turner, the leader of the Bloody Slave Rebellion in 1831, Cinque of Amistad fame, and Toussaint, Toussaint Louverture, who led the revolt against white European domination in Haiti. Brown's sympathy for the downtrodden emerged partly from his lifelong status as a struggling businessman who always lived near the poverty line. Few influential people in history have failed so miserably in so many different pursuits as John Brown. <laughs> he failed as a tanner, a shepherd, a cattle trader, a horse breeder, a lum lumber dealer, <laughs> a real estate speculator, and a wool distributor. Why these failures? Well, Brown had to provide for his growing family. He had 20 children, uh, 20 children with, with two wives. That's very complex. <laughs> uh, you've heard of cheaper by the dozen. How about cheaper by the two dozen? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, the, uh, uh, unfortunately, only nine of them survived him. Uh, in that day, as you well know, a lot of children died of childhood illnesses, which today are just easily wiped out by inoculations and so forth. Four of them died at one time, and uh, also others died by his side uh, in, in his uh, battles against slavery. So it, it wasn't that unusual to have huge families and have a lot of the children uh, die off. Um, he. Uh, his role as a provider uh, was impeded by his clumsiness as a businessman. He was devoted to the bygone subsistence economy by which people lived off the land and produced their own goods. But he had to earn money for his growing family. He tried unsuccessfully to succeed as a capitalist 
but he had neither the will nor the flexibility to do so. He was partly the victim of circumstance, too, because the very year he entered business full-time, 1837, marked the beginning of an economic downturn that lasted five years. Um, and actually, a lot of the property that he bought in his real estate speculation at, at that time, if he had managed to hang on to it for about 15 years, would have been worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So he wasn't that unintelligent. Uh, part of it was, was uh, bad timing, too. Falling deep into debt, he was sued by creditors, and he once declared bankruptcy. Nobody saw him as corrupt, but his bullheadedness hindered him in a capitalist world that demanded tact, ingenuity, and often slickness. Um, when he was a wool distributor, he would set his price, and he just wouldn't give. This is my price because my wool is good, and, and uh, that other guy's wool is bad. And you know, so. um, After failing in several businesses, he returned to a subsistence lifestyle when he took his family to live on the farm among uh, those blacks I mentioned earlier in North Elba, New York, where he chose to live and where he's buried. John Brown adopted anti-slavery violence in the 1850s because that decade saw slavery become embedded in American life in what seemed a permanent way. Slavery was reinforced by several government acts, such as the Fugitive Slave Law, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and the Dred Scott decision. In the South, slavery was now seen as a positive good, a positive good for both white and blacks. It was a noble institution that must be spread. Some Southerners actually recommended at that time that America invade Africa and enslave its millions of black people so that they might be exposed to the blessings of Christianity and Western culture. In the North, there was a lot of anti-slavery feeling but little anti-slavery action. The leading abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and William, uh, Wendell Phillips were pacifists who thought the slavery problem could be solved by dividing the nation and letting the evil South go its own way. They were what was called disunionist, they don't want a separation of the North and the South. Lincoln and the Republicans hated slavery, but they loved the American Union and therefore recoiled from the idea of a divisive war with the South. Shortly before the war in 1858, Lincoln declared that war was not the answer, that slavery was slowly disappearing on its own, although he said at that time it might take a century a century, if you can imagine slaves being around until 1958. <laughs> um, John Brown thought otherwise. He was driven to a fury by what he considered the North's cowardly response to, pr to pro-slavery violence. He was appalled that people were flocking into Kansas from the neighboring slave state of Missouri, taking over the Kansas polling booths. The fraudulent legislatures they elected claimed supremacy in Kansas and were even validated by the administrations of Presidents Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan. Meanwhile, pro-slavery newspapers preached murderous violence against abolitionists in the state, and what the newspapers preached, the pro-slavery settlers practiced. John Brown's violence in Kansas has never been put fully into context. Yeah, he supervised five murders on Pottawatomie Creek, and in the confusion of the Kansas legal system, he was never brought to justice. But my, my research shows that of the 36 recorded po political murders committed in Kansas between 1855 and 1858, 28 were committed by the pro-slavery side, only eight by the anti-slavery side. Uh, John Brown's party was responsible for five of those eight. Brown felt his violence was justified not only by pro-slavery action in Kansas, but also because of centuries of cruelty to blacks. For him, slavery itself was an act of war against an entire race. He was also giving the South some of, uh, some of his own medicine. He was getting back for decades of unavenged violence committed by Southern whites, not just against slaves, but also against free blacks and visiting Northerners suspected of abolitionism. Recent studies, studies have shown that over four-fifths of the acts of vigilante violence committed by Southern whites went unpunished. The South was a culture of dueling, bowie knives, and deadly feuds. Few people thought the less of the Southern President Andrew Jackson because he killed a man in a duel and had threatened to kill a number of others. Mark Twain uh, parodied, parodied Southern violence in his portrait in Huckleberry Finn of the family feud between the Shepherdsons and the Grangerfords. You might recall how Huck learns about the feud. Buck Grangerford tells Huck, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man and kills him. Then that other man's brother kills him then the other brothers on both sides goes for one another, then the cousins chip in, and by and by everybody's killed off and there ain't no more feud. A um, little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, really it was, it was that kind of uh, macho culture. Um, 
And it was in response to several such acts of wanton pro-slavery violence in uh, uh, Kansas that John Brown committed his retaliatory crime. As a contemporary journalist noted, quote, John Brown has brought violent Southern tactics to the Northern side, end quote. In a sense, his violence paid off because the South developed a panic about him that grew with his later violent actions. When in 1858 he liberated 11 slaves in Missouri and led them 52 days, 1,200 miles across the country to freedom toward Canada, his daring escapade was performed in the face of the entire nation. The Kansas governor put $3,000 on John Brown's head. President James Buchanan added $250, prompting Brown's joke that he'd gladly pay $2.50 for the head of President James Buchanan. Brown said, it's perfectly well understood I will not be taken, even though he was sort of pursued all the way. He was, was never close to being taken. Um, as for his raid on Harper's Ferry, many have called Brown crazy for thinking he, he could uproot the slave system by attacking the South with only 21 followers. Recent events, however, suggest that his plan was at least partly feasible. The plan was to make a quick strike, rally hundreds of emancipated blacks to his side, then flee with them to the Appalachian Mountains, which ran deep into the south. He aimed to scatter small groups of blacks. He, he knew them because he'd been a surveyor. He knew a lot of the uh, topography. Um, he aimed to scatter small groups of blacks and whites, a little bit like today's terrorist cells, along the Appalachian chain, using the mountainous terrain as a defense against pursuing forces. A close student of guerrilla warfare, he thought he could evade vastly superior forces by using caves and other natural defenses in the mountains. The success of such a strategy by the Afghan guerrillas against the huge Soviet army and by Osama bin Laden against the U.S. military suggests that it wasn't necessarily a crack brain scheme. He miscalculated, Brown miscalculated though, by expecting uh, an immediate massive response on the part of the liberated blacks. He was thinking of all those slave rebellions that exploded like the dynamite. Uh, he anticipated, as he put it, quote, the bees are going to swarm, end quote, as, as, he, uh, as soon as he struck Harpers Ferry. But the slaves in the area were unprepared. They didn't respond quite the way he'd expected. Uh, some of them did fight by his side, yes, and I think that that's been underestimated because some of them did fight by his side. A lot of them, however, you know, I think if a Martian came in this room, and uh, it, 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 it's the equivalent of, of, of imagining a Martian coming in and saying, imagine if you've been uh, enslaved for 30 years, and then this, this, this white guy with some black followers comes at midnight and says, you're free, and here's a spear to defend yourself if somebody attacks you. Um, it, uh, because they, they weren't as closely prepared as they should have been, um, and it was very difficult to prepare them because the intelligence would very easily leak out, uh, a lot of them didn't respond with the militancy that he expected, and uh, as a result, he kind of kept waiting for that to happen, and uh, it didn't happen, and this delay is what doomed his effort since it gave time for the Virginia militia and the U.S. Marines under Robert E. Lee to organize and capture John Brown and his men, and um, they were uh, in, they, and they got backed into the engine house, which is now called John Brown's Fort. Um, and um, he was hit among the, not hit, but he was fighting from the, uh, amid the fire engines there. And uh, Lieutenant Israel Green was sent by Robert E. Lee to uh, have his men take this ladder and bash down the doors of the, uh, the engine house. And they entered and, and they, they, cap they killed several and they captured John Brown. And uh, the only re reason that John Brown had any influence on history was because of this the sword, uh, because when uh, Lieutenant Green had left his house that morning in the rush, he had mistakenly picked up his dress sword instead of his military saber, and he stabbed, uh, John Brown kept stabbing him many times, <laughs> and the saber would, would have easily killed him, uh, prob probably in the first or second stroke, because he stabbed him in the head and, and the guts and everything. Um, but uh, John Brown accidentally lived, and as a result of this mere accident, uh, he had an effect on history. Uh, if he'd been killed, the incident would have been, uh, made the headlines but disappeared like Waco, Ruby Ridge, or Oklahoma City. After all, he didn't have much support in the North and, and even the inner circle that had backed him helped finance him called the Secret Six, distanced themselves uh, from him after the raid. Frederick Douglass went to Canada. Um, uh, Garrett Smith actually 
entered a lunatic asylum in Utica, New York. He kind of went crazy and there were several other people that had been close to him and then they backed off. So uh, he would have been more or less stranded as far as public opinion goes uh, if, 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 if he had been killed. It was his behavior during his imprisonment and trial that made an impression on bo both the North and the South. Henry David Thoreau said the words, not rifles, were his weapons. Words, not rifles. In the month and a half between his capture and his hanging, he wrote many letters and gave speeches in court that were widely reprinted in newspapers throughout the world. Uh, in all these communications, the theme was the same. John Brown kept declaring that he looked forward to giving his life for the nearly four million enslaved blacks in America. On the day that he was sentenced to death, he gave an impromptu speech to the Virginia court in which he declared, now, if it is deemed necessary that I should for forfeit my life for the furtherance of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust laws, I say, let it be done. Emerson found this speech so eloquent that he later said that it and the Gettysburg Address were the two greatest pieces of American oratory. Emerson, of course, was the nation's leading intellectual, and he was so moved by Brown's courage and selflessness that he called Brown, quote, the new saint who will make the gallows as glorious as the cross, a comparison with Christ that sped through America like a ricocheting bullet, inspiring northerners and outraging southerners. Nobody venerated Brown as much as Thoreau or Emerson did, but slowly the North, which initially had uh, dismissed Brown as a maddened criminal, even the anti-slavery figures had, uh, the North slowly moved toward the view that although Brown's actions may have been rash, his ideals at least were noble. On the morning that Brown was to be hanged, he was asked if he wanted a Christian minister to accompany him to the gallows. Brown refused, saying that no minister could be found in Virginia who did not approve of slavery. Instead, he said he wanted to be accompanied by the most miserable, ragged slave children that could be found. This didn't happen, but a legend arose that as, as he emerged from the prison cell, he was greeted by a slave mother who lifted up her baby to be kissed by him. And uh, can't see that very well, but uh, it's a painting um, by Thomas Hovenden, and you know you can see John Brown coming out of the, the prison. This didn't actually happen, but um, a, a, a real legend uh, arose about this, and, and he's, he's kissing the uh, the slave child. Um, so although the story was apocryphal, it might as well have been true because this is the kind of thing that John Brown imagined. Um, his actions and words fueled a paranoid panic in the South, um, and that's why Brown was overprotect, overprotected on the day of his hanging. Normally hangings in those days were public affairs with hundreds and even thousands of citizens present, but the Southerners were frightened of rumored attempts to rescue Brown, and so Robert E. Lee and his troops indulged in overkill with two rows of soldiers encircling the scaffold and many more soldiers stationed for miles around. Um, again, you can't see this too well, but uh, you can see the rows of soldiers, and John Brown, who's up here, he said, where, where are all the people? <laughs> he wanted the people there to, uh, to, to see him hang, because that was the normal thing in those days. And, uh, uh, but in, instead, uh, for miles around, they, uh, they had soldiers. Um, John Brown had a direct impact on the events that led to the Civil War. The immediate trigger of the war, of course, was the South's secession after the election of Abraham Lincoln. However, the choice of Lincoln itself was influenced by the hostilities inflamed by John Brown. The Republicans, tarred by their opponents with the responsibility for Harper's Ferry, tried to calm sexual animosities by choosing the moderate dark horse Lincoln over more controversial candidates, particularly William Henry Seward. The election really should have been against William Henry Seward against uh, um, Douglas, but uh, the little giant, uh, the Democrat. But it turns out that um, the uh, Republicans decided, decided to go with a safer candidate, more moderate candidate, Lincoln. And the Southern, Southern extremists, in the meantime, manipulated the panic over John Brown's raid to add fuel to an anti-Northern frenzy. The Southern view of John Brown is typified by this pro-slavery political cartoon. Again, I'm sorry this is a little clearer. It's an old cartoon. Uh, you, that's Abraham Lincoln sitting on an altar it's called the worship of the North. This is the, the South, the way the South viewed the North, the way the South viewed the North. Um, a shrine 
And here's, able, here's the dying Ameri uh, American Union. The idea is that, that Lincoln had killed the American Union. It was ridiculous, but he, he loved the American Union. This is the Southern view. And here are all the Republican leaders around him kind of worshiping him. Sumner and Seward and all these people. And here above all is John Brown, like an idol on the same level as Satan. This is Satan, here's John Brown and carrying his famous pike, the pikes, uh, the spears that he wanted to uh, hand to the African Americans once, once they were uh, freed so they could defend themselves against pursuers. And this was a symbol, uh, a symbol of the demonism, the demonism of, of the North. And, and here's a caricature, a uh, picture of, of an African carrying a John Brown pike. Down here, the word Puritanism. Uh, the South thought that all the evils of the North came from the uh, Puritanism, which let loose all this chaos. The, the South saw itself as a very uh, stable, uh, orderly society, and the North was very chaotic. And Puritanism, and here's uh, Negro worship, Negro worship, and atheism, socialism, women's rights, spirits, spirit wrappings, all these isms. Up here, ego. Uh, they thought uh, everything came from interpret. Uh, interpretation, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, like Emerson and Thoreau and self-reliance and all that. So it's a pretty rich cartoon, although, again, it's a little bit difficult to, to see, uh, particularly the, uh, the writing on, on the altar there. Um, anyway, uh, by demonizing Brown and linking him with the entire North, Southern extremists whipped up a secessionist fury that led to the splintering of Lincoln's opponents into three parties, thereby ensuring his election and bringing on secession. The polarized passions created by Harper's Ferry then contributed to the election of Lincoln. One might posit that a Lincoln presidency would not have existed without John Brown. Had Lincoln's opposition been unified under a single candidate as in normal times, Lincoln would have been defeated since the combined popular vote of his opponents was 2.8 million to his 1.9 million. Had John Brown not been in the picture, the secessionists would have had difficulty getting enough Southern su support. The secessionists were a very small group in the South. And um, although they had political power, but in terms of popular support, they, they didn't have that much. And the John Brown thing really helped them uh, generate this kind of drive towards secession. Um, and uh, uh, they would have had very difficult uh, getting enough Southern support to divide the Democratic Party. And in that case, as I mentioned, the popular Stephen Douglas almost certainly would have been elected president. Secession would then have been avoided, the Civil War would have been delayed, and slavery would have continued until, in all probability, an even more catastrophic war occurred, would have occurred later on. And what's to guarantee the North would have won that one? Uh, as it was the uh, South, twice almost won the war anyway, and that's, uh, I mean, you, know, you can never tell what was gonna happen. As it was, Lincoln was elected, 11 southern states did secede, and America had the bloodiest war in its history, the war that ended slavery. At first, the conservative Lincoln con uh, considered it only a war to save the Union, not to free the slaves. He said in December 1861, emancipation would be equivalent to a John Brown raid on a gigantic scale. At that time, he was fighting to preserve the Union, but four years later, the war become, in effect, just that. Uh, a John Brown raid. By then, Lincoln was like Brown in his vision of a unified America that must rid itself of slavery through violence. Uh, Lincoln's generals, particularly Grant and Sherman, launched a total war campaign, cutting a swath of death and devastation across the South. Union troops marched South, thundering forth the, the North's favorite war song with its bracing words. Uh, John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave, his soul's marching on. How many people have heard that one? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because I was on a book tour and uh, when I was in Kansas, even little seven-year-olds started, started singing. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but what's funny about the songs actually was uh, began of all places in South Carolina, the um, uh, cradle of secession, as a Methodist hymn. Hey, brothers, will you meet us? And uh, <laughs> then it was, uh, and then it spread up north uh, in, in that form. You know, the tune is, is to a, a hymn. And then uh, the 12th Massachusetts Regiment just had someone named John Brown, and had no connection to John Brown whatsoever. But he was always late to the drills. And the, they, they kept saying, he's so lazy, he's, he's like dead. And someone said, yeah, John Brown's body lies moldering the grave. So they started singing that. And pretty soon it could apply to the real John Brown. And pretty soon the only uh, regiment that couldn't s bear to sing the song was the Massachusetts 12th, because it's John Brown. <laughs> 
much joked about but much beloved uh, died in one of the first battles. So it's about the only nor northern re regiment that refused to sing. Of course, later, uh, Julie Ward Howe picked it up and uh, created the Battle Hymn of the Republic with the uh, famous chorus of glory, glory, hallelujah. Um, anyway, in the second inaugural, uh, Lincoln declared that a righteous God might very well demand oceans of blood to be spilled to rid the nation of slavery. Like John Brown, Lincoln was now the Cromwellian warrior against slavery. By the end of the war, the South's claim that Lincoln was a reincarnated John Brown, it had made that claim from the beginning, but now it had a, a kind of ring of truth. Just after the war ended, a pro-slavery journalist lamented, the Republican administration is simply a John Brown raid. The name of John Brown and Abraham Lincoln will indeed go down to posterity together into the abyss of infamy and eternal shame. This is a, you know, a Southerner who was looking back at the Civil War. The policy of the Republican Party since it came in power has uh, been a faithful carrying out of the work begun by John Brown. The administration of Abraham Lincoln was only a John Brown raid on the grandest scale. It was nothing more. This is the place that it's going to occupy in history. A John Brown raid on the grandest scale, well, this connection between Brown and the Civil War is captured powerfully in John Stuart Curry's famous 1942 mural um, for the Kansas State House, showing John Brown as a gigantic, angry, Moses-like figure towering over the national landscape with the fallen Civil War soldiers. Here's a Union soldier, here's a Confederate soldier. Here are the slaves he's fighting to free. There's the artist. Here's the cyclone, which is the forthcoming uh, Civil War. And there's obvious, not only Moses symbolism, but also Christ symbolism with the cross uh, and so forth. Um, in light of uh, Brown's influence on the war and on the rise of civil rights, uh, one, think, one would think that he would be a ubiquitous presence in American culture, but his face doesn't appear on our bills and, and coins. There are a few statues of him. Um, uh, there is one that I'll show you in a second, but uh, very few. The main reason for this is that his reputation after peaking during the Civil War and Reconstruction collapsed thereafter. In the period of Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan, when segregation reigned, biographers, historians, and conservative views reflected the post-Reconstruction temper, cared little for his ra uh, progressive racial agenda, and instead portrayed him as a lunatic horse, horse thief and murderer. The Civil Rights Movement brought about a partial recuperation of his reputation. In the early 20th century, the Niagara Movement, which is a forerunner of the NAACP, which led to the Civil Rights Movement, hailed Brown as, quote, one who had no predecessors and can have no successors. That was at one of the founding meetings. Of course, thousands of other Americans have paved, paved the way for civil rights. We know that. But there are good reasons why African Americans have often singled out John Brown for praise. He was the only white reformer of his time who lived continuously among blacks, the only one who rose wrote a revised American constitution, awarding them full rights, not just them, but Native Americans and women uh, as well. Uh, the only one who gave his life in a violent effort to liberate the slaves. This closeness of Brown to African Americans has been sensed by many blacks from Frederick Douglass and W.B. Du Bois through Langston Hughes to the leaders of the 60s uh, civil rights movement. Actually, I met a number of people who asked me, John Brown, wasn't he black? And I answer, well, not by blood, maybe, but by feeling, by instinct, by sympathy. His intimacy with blacks is captured in this moving statue. I, I think it's moving, of Brown standing with a slave boy, uh, produced in 1935 by the sculptor Joseph, Joseph Paglia. The sculpture stands near John Brown's last home and resting place in North Elba, uh, New York. And, uh, there's an attempt to create the intimacy here, the parallel in this arm with this arm, the parallel in this arm with this arm, the, the legs are almost exactly the same uh, uh, parallel. Uh, they're, they're touching each other, the clothing is similar. Obviously, the black boy uh, has his shirt ripped and so forth, so uh, showing his uh, wretched condition. But in a way, the clothing of John Brown is not much better. He actually never wore clothing quite like this, but the sculptor wanted to emphasize, and also the uh, the eyes coming together here. There's so many parallel planes going on here, and I think that it, it captures that kind of intimacy very well. Although uh, respected in some circles, uh, Brown nonetheless remains for many Americans a fringe figure, whom it's more comfortable to forget than to revere. When Trent Lott of Mississippi was the leader of the Senate 
a senator from Kansas proposed a bill that would have instituted a National John Brown Day. Uh, Lot's response, over my dead body. <laughs> However, I, I would ask Mr. Lott and others like him, what would have happened had John Brown and a few other forceful reformers not interfered with a racist juggernaut that America had become at that time? Even the Civil War, which ended slavery at the cost of some 620,000 American lives, didn't produce the racially, racially harmonious nation that Brown had dreamed of. Civil rights and social justice are still works in progress. One complication about John Brown is that some modern terrorists like Timothy McVeigh and the abor abortion doctor killer Paul Hill have called themselves his followers. He has also been compared to bin Laden. But if Brown was a terrorist, he was an American one and underlying the word far distant from the fanatical Muslim bin Laden or the narrow anarchist McVeigh. Even though Brown was every bit as religious as bin Laden, he counted among his closest followers, Jews, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, and of course, he fought with blacks and often followed their advice, was close to Native Americans. Whereas bin Laden's final goal is to create a Muslim theocracy in which all opposing religions and ethnicities are banned, Brown's goal was a fully integrated nation in which all religions, all races, and both genders had absolutely equal rights. Now, anyone who knows me knows I'm no fan of violence. If anything, I was shaped by the passive resistant sit-ins of the 1960s. Still, we should recognize that sometimes a social evil is so hideous, so entrenched, that violence alone is the answer. Let's say there have been a terrorist in Nazi Germany who have managed to dislodge Hitler before the deaths of between 6 million and 12 million people in the concentration camps, or perhaps uh, spared the lives of more than 2 million Cambodians in uh, Cambodia. Wouldn't we all applaud that person who uh, uh, cut that off? After all, all, Brown himself had once refused military service on moral grounds and took up arms only because it looked like slavery was going to be around for a very long time. And how about, how about his biggest fan, Henry David Thoreau? Early in his career, Thoreau was the biggest passive resistor of all time when he wrote Civil Disobedience, the classic essay on nonviolence that later influenced Gandhi and Martin Luther King, Jr. But when Thoreau saw, 10 years later, that slavery was getting much worse, not much better. He did a complete about face and championed the violent abolitionism of John Brown. I try to suggest in my book, it was because of Thoreau and Emerson, basically, that John Brown kind of came back into the mix a little bit. Uh, the most common charge made against John Brown is that he killed innocent civilians in the, in the name of a higher cause. But just think of the millions of civilians the US military has killed for a higher cause. Think of the 200,000 civilians we killed in the Philippines in the early 20th century. Think of the hundreds of thousands vaporized at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. How about My Lai and other incidents in Vietnam or look at Iraq. Most estimates of the number of civilians, mainly women and children, killed by American bomb bombs since shock and awe began uh, stand at around 30,000, although the real number is unknown. Some estimates go as uh, high as 100,000. More relevant to John Brown, consider the Civil War itself. During the total total war campaign of Grant Sherman, untold thousands of innocent civilians were killed. Sherman boasted that 80% of the devastation that he wreaked upon Georgia was simply to, quote, make Georgia howl, end quote. Some might say, yeah, but those deaths occurred during war. They were just collateral damage. Well, if this collateral damage could come back to life, if those victims of indiscriminate violence could speak, they would say, it makes no difference who's committing the violence. Besides, as mentioned, John Brown thought slavery itself was a state of war, a war that had been going on for centuries against millions of enslaved blacks. And he was not indiscriminate in his violence. One of my reviewers who doesn't like John Brown writes cynically, one wonders what Brown would have done if he had jet, air jet airplanes at his disposal. My reply, he wouldn't have used them because too many innocents would have been killed. He even refused to, um, uh, to kill, he had a chance to kill the guy that killed his own son. He said, no, don't, his men wanted to go, to leave him alone, don't, don't, don't touch him. Um, John Brown was highly, highly selective uh, in both the choice and the timing uh, of his targets. So much so that actually some of my other reviewers, including uh, Barbara Ehrenreich in the New York Times Book Review, claimed that he was no terrorist whatsoever. 
By the same token, uh, Brown made it a point to be civil toward prisoners uh, that he took in, in his anti-slavery battles in Kansas and Harper's Ferry. He disallowed any form of harassment or disrespect toward his prisoners. Think of Andersonville Prison or, or Abu Ghraib, and then think just the opposite of those places, and you get a sense of how John Brown dealt with his hostages. The bottom line is that for somebody of John Brown's moral vision, slavery, a system of oppression, murder, torture, rape, had to be eliminated by any means. At first, he thought he could dislodge slavery single-handedly. If he had succeeded, if he had succeeded in his plan, perhaps those 620,000 American lives may have been spared. But by the time of his execution, he had grudgingly a more realistic idea of what it would take to uproot the South's peculiar institution. As he was led out of the Charlestown prison on the way to the scaffold, he, he handed a guard a note that read, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with very much bloodshed. Unfortunately, John Brown was right. Thank you. Thank you.